actually Eastman's 50th birthday, 1971, 50 years ago. Long before the uh, Anyway, the celebration next Wednesday night, we will have a celebration around Eastman. There will be uh, music, and you're supposed to make a lot of noise at 8 o'clock with a bell. And there will be birthday cakes <coughs> given out. And if you look at highlights or the website, eastman50.org, you'll see where they're going to be. Then next Friday night, <coughs> there'll be a DJ. Saturday, there'll be entertainment on the beaches. There'll be uh, surprises all over the place. Next Saturday night is a dance. Uh, for the DJ and the dance, you will have to sign up. And then Sunday is Eastman Yardway. There'll be various tours and um, at 4 o'clock, it will end with the wine group doing a program up at the center. So it should be a nice celebration weekend. So, and the center presents in August. I'm going to do this very quickly so we can start. On August 11th, we are going to have a steel band. And then August 25th, there's a couple in Croydon that owns a uh, craft brewery. And they're going to be at the center, and we're going to have a program where you can sample their wines and eat our dirt. Yeah. Yeah. And that, too, will be a sign. <laughs> and so that's the center present. Now, tonight, we are pleased to present this program, and it's kind of appropriate considering our 50th celebration is coming. One of our committee members, Claren Warner, is responsible for uh, getting all of this program together for you. So she's going to announce the program from here on in. Turn it on. Yeah, turn it on. Just turn it. We're going to use this one again. Fine, yes. go right in. Just put it in here. Oh, that's clever. Okay. Hi. Okay, it's been very good. I've done the first program since you know what, right? And um, I was thinking about the history of Eastman and trying to put it into the context um, our days here, uh, into the context of the days when it was started. And um, one time I was up having dinner at, the, at Forbes, and I saw Cindy Bittinger sitting on the porch. And I know Cindy from when our kids were together at Canberra High School, and I couldn't figure out why she'd be here. And then I learned um, her history with Eastman, and she is a historian. Um, she is the um, historian for the city of Hanover and has written several books. And she was the I want to say curator at Globe. No, director. Director. Sorry, I don't know the difference. <laughs> 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 I'm the director. Is this is awesome. Oh, it's significant. Um, anyway, she will be talking about her family's history here and um, activities when uh, they were here in the 70s. Um, and then following that, Ken Story, who is um, um, currently the town clerk. Uh, and has lived in Grantham since he was seven. He's in the yellow house next to the library, which indeed was in that, was an inn at one time. Uh, and he can give us the perspective from um, having lived here as he's been West developed. We're kind of focusing on the Grantham side. Apologies to the other towns. Um, but um, we're just, there's just, we have an hour. So we'll do that part tonight. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear? All right. Hello? Yes. Yeah. That's better. Take it out. Take it out of there and just hold it. Hold it. That's good? Yes. yes. First of all, it's so nice to see real people. <laughs> I have been on Zoom too long. 
long. Have you been on Zoom too long also? Yes. And I, as I said, I'm the head of the Hanover Historical Society. I've had to put all my programs on Zoom. I'm so sick of it. But the nice thing is, you can pull in people from all over the world. We had people from Hong Kong on one of our programs, from Jamaica. So that part is, is lovely. And since this is going to be taped tonight, maybe this will be circulated somewhat as well. So it's nice to have these stories. And I should start off by saying, um, with my parents being here, and you're going to hear about them, you're going to hear about some other families, um, we rep my husband and I represent 50 years, because my parents were the first people, along with a few others, who lived at Eastman, lived here, and were in the first houses. And then my husband's sisters also got here. They, uh, his sister Jane and her husband Jack here are still at Alpine Vista. So we have continuous 50 years. Now, is there anybody else like that in our group? No? Okay, so I guess I'm pretty rare. Okay, so thank you for inviting me. And I want to thank uh, Claire and Mary for their kind introduction. Um, I have spent a lot of time at Eastman, and Claire asked me to put together some of the slides. And uh, I'll tell a few stories, and then I'd like you to join in and tell some stories as well, because that, that's always much more fun. First of all, um, my parents' names were Phil and Francie Allen. Did any of you know them? All right, okay, the answer up. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think we have to get a sense of who my parents were to see why they chose to be in this first round of families at Eastman. What got them to leave Wilton, Connecticut, and what attracted them to the wilds of New Hampshire? I will use their names, Phil and Francie, in this presentation. I remember Phil stated that one could live much longer in New Hampshire and live on less income. Do you not all agree? Well, yeah, that could be fascinating. His career was mainly in publishing with McLean Hunter. They also had a house in Kennebunkport, Maine. So they had planted a flag in northern New England before setting out for Grantham. When he was 62, he retired and planned to build a house at Eastman while he was commuting and consulting um, occasionally in New York and would travel down there. They would go between their two homes in Maine and New Hampshire during the summer. Francie liked their house in Wilton, but was glad Phil decided to retire. Remember, that's a long commute from Wilton, Connecticut to New York City and he was able to end those commutes. She was mainly a housewife with interest in gardening, antiques, sports, and at one time she had been a secretary for an architect. They first looked at New Seabury, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Did you realize that was Emil Hansen's first project? A lot of you are nodding, yes, okay. However, the Cape is hard to get to. Those of you who have homes on the Cape know you have to get up at 3 a.m. to get there. Uh, in, in today's world, anyhow. Um, so New Hampshire seemed a better plan. Phil was an avid outdoorsman and really wanted to ski, hunt, fish, boat, and play golf as much as possible. Francie's adult children were not that far away. Jane, my sister, was in Boston, I was in Princeton, and my brother was in Vermont. Also, grandchildren could visit New Hampshire and participate in all the sports. So my parents were here from 1971 to 1994 when they moved to Florida. All right, what was life like then? Well, let's look at a couple of pictures. Here is a very early picture of their house, and you can see pipes and stones, and it still just looks like it's being uh, constructed. And now today, this is what it looks like today. We went up there and took the picture. Um, when I asked about my, my parents, they were very social. They wanted weekend parties. There would be many gatherings. You're probably still the same way today with about 30 people. And that was sometimes difficult because in um, Grantham, there weren't that many people there. My mother was very anxious when she uh, got out her gin and tonic in the evenings to have some friends around. So at one point, she had the security guards come in, too. <laughs> so she could have a drink with people. Uh, my dad, Phil Allen, volunteered at Dartmouth and helped out at track and field 
He was so beloved there that they made him a member of the class of 1935. And here they are marching. You all know about the uh, opening of the uh, fall homecoming. Well, here they were with the group carrying the sign. I mean, for my dad, this was like a creme de la creme. He did not go to Dartmouth, and here he is part of the class. He went to Ohio West. So this was wonderful. His other big thrill was presenting George Bush here. And you can see the Eastman sign behind him. Uh, Dad was very political, and he always was getting out the vote. He was quite the Republican here, but in those days, everybody was a Republican. <laughs> Nowadays, most people are Democrats. But anyhow. Um, and then another interesting story. Uh, my sister was a single parent in Boston, and my parents had gotten to know Ed and Dottie Leiter. Now, some of any of you remember the Leiters? No? Okay. Well, then I should tell you a little bit about them. They were one of the first families, and their son Bob has profiled them in Eastman Magazine. My parents asked the Leiters, who lived in Newton during the week, if they could take this little girl, and see her, she's about age five, up to visit her grandparents. So from time to time, they did that. And I interviewed Cindy Jane, that's her name, who's now in her 50s. She said she has good memories of summer, spring, and winter camp at my parents' house. And the Liders were the first to build on Eagle Drive and focused on activities at Dartmouth, which was Ed's alma mater. Um, now, the next story is kind of an odd one. Uh, most of you drive by Allen's Drive? OK. It didn't exist. And oh, first I want you to see that of, of the, on the ice. It did not exist. Uh, you had to go up Snow Hill, and then you could get out of their house. So Dad took mowers, bulldozers. He made his own road. <laughs> it's that tiny little thing on the map. But when you drive up on the road today, and go through, it's your first road on the left, right? Yeah. Pretty much. OK. He finished the dirt road. And my husband, who's here, said, why don't you call that Allen's Alley for yourself? And so we did. He was head of the road commission here. <laughs> and as you can imagine, he was head of most things. And he just said, OK, it's Allen's Alley. But later on, when they moved up here, they paved it and named it a more distinguished <laughs> All right, what was here at the time? Well, Rainy Store was here. How many of you remember Rainy Store? Oh, all right, quite a few remember that. And I think happened, and Eleanor ran it for 32 years to retire, in, according to the news, to, in 1985. If they didn't have it, you didn't need it, or you went to New London or Hanover. South Cove had some Lula's restaurant. We've been talking about that tonight a little bit. A small pool, small rec room and a little shack opened in the uh, summer called Peppermint Patties. And you still have peppermint patties. Um, my father had so much peppermint ice cream there that he just kept eating it forever in his retirement years. Um, in the course of the winter, you had skating on the pond, I just showed you that picture, and skiing at Snow Hill with a chair. You also would maybe go to Son of Bell. How many of you have been on that? Or many have there. I asked my grandchild today, who's age four, I said, have you been on Sunday Be Bell yet? She said, no. So we've got a trip planned. That was wonderful. And here are my kids, plus my sister's other child, in the driveway at my parents' house. Um, and of course, the ski hill that had a short life. Get into that. But here, here's a picture of my mom with my son and they're building a snowman. And I thought I'd put that in to liven things up. <laughs> the, skip, the chairlift was installed in 1972 on the southern shore of Eastman Pond. How many of you remember the chairlift? Or, oh, a lot of you remember that, okay. There were three trails and my children skied all of them with me. The value of the ski hill was questioned in the 1990s and a survey of the residents showed that 68% of the residents didn't use it. So in 1999, it was closed, and Whaleback tried to purchase the double chairlift. That didn't pass, but the chairlift was removed, and there's no more downhill. That's why I put that in, just to commemorate that. Each seat 
season had its treasures, but of course, there was a mud season. <laughs> My parents decided to leave during mud season and go to Sanibel, Florida. So they started a pattern of two months in Florida during mud season. Here's a picture of when they were welcomed back by my family. We had moved to Hanover, New Hampshire in 1988, and I was just mentioning to one of my friends here that my father, Bill Allen, couldn't persuade anybody to do anything, it seemed. He's the one who got so many volunteers up at Dartmouth, and he persuaded my whole family to leave Princeton and come up here. So he was quite the convincer. Um, there was a celebration of the longevity. Well, here are my kids got older, of course. Um, here I am, my mother, and two children. And there was a celebration. Do any of you remember the celebration? We think it was 1991, the 20 years. Anybody remember that? Oh, just a few remember that. Okay. Um, it was a parade, and if you notice, it's summer, but we're all carrying ski equipment. <laughs> I think that was to celebrate our great skiing um, that we did. And you'll see one of the women here in the pink blouse there was Uta Cord. And she was a very, very close friend of my parents. How many of you knew Uta? All right, many. Okay. Uta lived at, the, at Eastman for almost 30 years, beginning in 1972. So she was one of the early pioneers as well. She had quite a story which has been made into a short film called Surviving Hitler, A Love Story. And I encourage Claren to maybe show this one night because it's so well done. It's oral history by Yuda with excellent archival photos of her family. And it was history swirling around her. She was born in Berlin in 1920. And when Hitler was in power, she and her family were active in the resistance. Her partner, Helmut, was involved in the Valkyrie plot July 20th, 1944. This was the attempt to assassinate Hitler by his inner circle. Yuda, her parents, and Helmut were all jailed at the very end of the war and probably would have been executed. Only when the Russians stormed into Berlin in May of 1945 and freed these prisoners were they released. Surviving the war, Helmut and Yuda married in 1945. She said it's one of the first marriages in Germany. Um, after the war. Then in 1952, they moved to the States. They lived in New Jersey and California. Then they raised their three children, but he died in 1972, and Yuda came here. She was an artist and teacher. Up here, she taught a Head Start follow-through program in Lebanon. I distinctly remember her at the loom, weaving fabric. Some of you probably remember that, too. And Lynn, she played tennis with our family. Matter of fact, she was a bit German. We didn't get there on time. She did not approve of that. <laughs> she really liked us to be there, promptly. Her home was Alpine Vista next door to my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, um, Jane Beerwith and Jack Beerwith, the ones I said who were still here. Jane owned the house with her sister Margaret, and you could see Margaret in this parade. Margaret's the one wearing the ski hat in the summer, of course. That was kind of cute. Okay, my next family is a group we knew quite well. They bought land in Eastman in 72, but wanted to build a house in retirement. Don McWork. How many of you remember Don McWork? Oh, very few. Okay, the McWorks. He was president of the Empire City Subway Company in New York City which is still responsible for maintaining underground conduits in Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, the family lived in Bronxville, New York, a suburb, so the McWorks rented an Eastman over the years and then built a house in 1983 to move in the next year. The house was on a road to be called Downhill Drive. Marie McWork objected to that name so much that it was changed to Summit Drive. You see how these things sort of got changed in the early years. Um, and then I showed you their house. It's the one with the, the little perch on the top. And then here they are, the three daughters, and they wanted to enjoy the great outdoors. Don was a club champion at golf, and in those days you had to play the, the nine holes twice to make 18. Did you realize that? You had to say the same and he still won, Don still won, was club champion. Leslie is one of the daughters, uh, was spent a lot of time here starting at age 12. 
and she remembers doing water ballet with her sisters in the Eastman Lake. Marie volunteered at the gift shop. Here's Marie in the work. She volunteered at the gift shop with my mother. Here she is with a grandchild and with a little dog. And the dog is very important because the daughter, Leslie, wrote a book, many books, um, about Tucker, the little uh, Scotty dog. And Leslie also designed t-shirts. And here are my kids uh, as models for her art. And Leslie would sell these t-shirts and sweatshirts in, uh, in town, in Hanover, at the, at the summer fairs and that kind of thing. And Leslie went on to have an international career in design. She is a very multi-talented multi person. Here's some of her, more of her designs. And here she is today. She is now an astrologer. And she works with mental health professionals and has a new holistic healing. Um, she's always loved Eastman. And I have wonderful news for you. She's moving here in August. <laughs> so you are about to have an astrologer who's world famous move in. And you can invite her, I mentioned her to Claren, to give a presentation about her work. I'm sure she'd love to do that. Um, there are many more families to discuss, but most, as you can imagine, were retired. One person who stayed very active was Jean Delury. How many of you remember Jean? All right, not, no, not, okay. She was a good friend of my parents. She was the mother of five children, but she moved to Eastman in those very early years, and she had very little contact with her husband. After living in Argentina and Venezuela, she was mainly at her Eastman house. My parents took her under wing and got her involved in the community. She began a book club at Eastman. She wrote for many publications in the Upper Valley. She enjoyed slapstick comedy at the Newport Opera House and Eastman. My parents were delighted that she married Tom Simon. Now, you may remember Tom Simon. I distinctly remember them holding hands at one of the social gatherings at my parents' house. Jean died at her home here at age 72 from leukemia. So, to sum up, those who came to Eastman in the 1970s were mostly retired, but many wanted to stay very active as volunteers in our surrounding communities and at Eastman. They valued their time and joined sports, and recreation on the land here, hopefully their spirit still emanates from what you all are doing still. Because they created quite a wonderful community in my view. That's it for my slide. <laughs>
with Cindy about the uh, about doing this. Um, Grantham was a very, very different place in uh, 1964. Uh, at the time, Interstate 89 was being built, but when we moved here in 64, I think they had stopped construction. I started in Congress and they stopped in London. So the, uh, they were resuming the construction as we were moving in, but it wasn't complete all the way up to 91 in Vermont. So in the 60s, in 64, 65, 66, that construction resumed, and, um, and they were building it all the way through, and got up through probably by about 66, uh, everything was, was open. What a lot of people don't know outside of the historical society is that when they stopped, when they finally completed the interstate through, there was a six mile stretch between exit 13 and exit 16 that was two lanes, undivided two lanes. Uh, and the accidents that occurred on that six mile stretch were pretty horrific. Um, it was one of those things where the money ran out, the plan had always been to do a divided four lane, but they ran out of money so they had to live with it for a few years. Uh, the accidents were bad enough that they finally got the money, resumed construction, and by 69, I believe it was a, a, a divided four lane all the way through. Um, I mentioned 89 because without 89, we're not here tonight. Um, uh, Grantham was a very isolated place back in the mid-60s. Um, one of the things that I remember having to get used to, having come here from suburban Boston, was the whole, uh, the whole concept of a party line, uh, a phone line that you shared with other people. And that was something, we had a four, four people in our party line in our house, and we knew it was a phone was for us when the phone rang a long and a short. That's when you knew it was, you, it was for you. you. Otherwise, you'd get two longs, two shorts, and I think a short and a long. Uh, so, and that meant uh, when you heard that, that someone else was on the line, and of course, there were those who just felt they had to eavesdrop. So people would listen in on your phone calls, um, whether you wanted to or not. My mother found this an enormous source of aggravation because uh, she would, when someone else would pick up the phone and was listening in, your signal was diminished significantly. So the person you were talking to could not hear you as well, nor could they hear you as well. So my mother finally got fed up, ordered the private line, and that was that. But this is the kind of town Grantham was at the time. Um, my first trip to Eastman Pond was probably in the mid, I'd say 66 or 67. Uh, we had friends who lived on the North Grantham Road, uh, Will and Polly Hastings. And uh, Will had been up and grown up around here and knew this area very well. Uh, he knew Eastman was a very pretty place and a place to come picnic. So a bunch of us hopped in with food and drinks and the pond on the back of his, um, his uh, international four-wheel drive came up the road that I believe is now the main entrance road into Eastman, but didn't look a thing like, like it does now at the time. Uh, we drove about two miles an hour, and the, the, the car going like this over the road the whole time. We finally ended up, though, in what is now South Cove, because uh, the view as you're coming across the dam now, as you look north across the pond, is exactly what I remember seeing when I was, I don't know, eight, nine years old. Uh, that was exactly where we picnicked and where we were. And Eastman at the time was a pristine, completely undeveloped place. It was beautiful, it still is, but at the time it was very remote and it was not at all easy to get. Um, later in the 60s, after the interstate was all taken care of, of course the Controlled Environment Corporation came in, purchased the land um, from International from Rockwell and uh, what had been all around here, all around the lake, and began, uh, began development. One of the stories was as a kid in 1970, as a kid of 13, uh, having lived for now six years in what had been a felt like a very small, very bucolic town, uh, having uh, Eastman, the prospect of Eastman coming in and all these people coming in from out of town, out of state, was very exciting to me. So I went to a lot of the meetings that were held at the town hall, such as it was at the time, uh, including one meeting where I think uh, the controlled environment was trying to get some kind of admissions from the town. I know the selectmen were there. And one of the funny stories that happened was there was a young man representing controlled environment, he even had a windbreaker with a logo on it sitting in the front near the front. And someone in the, in the audience asked the uh, selectman, well, what's gonna happen when Eastman starts to fill up with people? What's that gonna mean for our school system? And this young man who was representing controlled environment spoke up and said, oh, no, 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 this is gonna be second homes for people. There won't be kids coming here to the school system. <laughs> now it's like three quarters of the kids in the Grand school system live in Eastman, so. Um, Anyway, uh, one of the other stories I just wanted to tell about was we talked about 71 being the, the anniversary. Uh, when uh, when the lots started to, they started laying out the lots in Eastman to be sold. They hired a, uh, a company, a civil engineering firm, 
out of Melrose, Massachusetts, named Hayes Engineering. And they sent uh, several crews up here, and they laid out all the lots up here in Eastland. My brother, my older brother George, was actually working on one of those crews for a while. And the fact that one of the crews stayed in our house. My mother rented out. We had a spare bedroom. We put a couple of the guys in the crew up in the bedroom. She rented a room to them. So we got to know a lot of those guys. Got to know a lot about Eastman as, of course, the, of them uh, putting up a lot of things here uh, uh, within towns, uh, within, within the Eastman community. So um, the, uh, the one thing that, uh, that I did want to mention, I think I said something clear about this was, the connection between Eastman and the sort of Grantham townspeople early on was a little rough at times. I think a lot of uh, people in Grantham were grateful for Eastman and once the lot started to sell and what that meant for the uh, what that meant for the uh, tax base. Uh, my mother, uh, at one point, I think at 75 or 76, her tax bill was $147. Um, so the, the expanding the tax base really helped out a lot of people in town. But um, again, you had people coming in from out of town. Grantham, again, had been such an isolated place where everybody knew each other, maybe sometimes a little too well. And now we had people coming in from outside. And a lot of people took some getting used to, to have sort of out of towners, if you will, uh, coming in, coming to Rainy Store, coming in to uh, use what amenities we had. Um, so it took some time, I think, for people to feel comfortable with each other. But I think that's happened. I'm really glad it's happened. Uh, I remember our my predecessor, this president, uh, Alan Walker, pointing out on one of the tours we did that um, about, at least I would say 80% of the people on the tour were from Easton. So people have taken a real interest in Grantham here and it's something we're very, very, very happy about. So we're glad you have Eastman's here and it's done a, been a great thing for the town, a great thing for the area and we're just really glad that everyone's here. Thanks all, all of you for coming. Home. 
<laughs> so we have to make sure we destroy it. We threw it in the fire. <laughs> so that was my first experience out here at Eastman. And it was very nice. And then one day we heard that this property had been sold. And we said, well, we're going to have to buy this piece of property. Well, now the South Coast condo sit on there. So that was a dream that didn't quite come true. <laughs> But anyway, it was um, it was a fun time to be here before Eastman came in, and um, we met wonderful friends here. And I'm now the treasurer of the Historical Society, so I have learned a lot about this town. And my actual um, job here tonight is to hopefully gather some volunteers. Um, we're dwindling in numbers there, which is one of those things that happens in a lot of uh, organizations are <laughs> having the same problem. But just to give you an idea of what we do there, if anybody has an interest in uh, ancestry research, we, we get a lot of people coming in and looking for, you know, history here of their families. Um, one of the gals that just left us, Ray Tober, I don't know if you know her. Um, anyway, she was particularly into maps. Um, she's put together some great books uh, for us there with, um, basically she's taken maps that we have there and condensed them into other forms. Um, we have displays. We had another member who was really into old tools, many of which she found out here at Eastman. Um, I don't know if any of you have done the trail that goes up by Anderson Pond, and um, there's old cellar holes that you can see out through there. Um, she found a lot of interesting old rusty tools, and so those are now on display at the Historical Society. But, you know, we need to refresh things, so somebody with um, an interest in doing that type of thing would be most helpful. Um, we have acquired several photo albums of Eastman activities. Unfortunately, the pictures don't identify who the people are. Um, our little group can identify a few of them, but uh, we're kind of thinking maybe we should do some kind of a, an activity where, you know, name the, name the people. But if you have a little time, we're open Fridays from 1 to 4. Um, just stop in, we'll hand you a photo album and you can look through it if you've been here a while. Hopefully you can identify, help us identify some of these people. Um, we would like to get digitizing all of our photos and we have lots of them. Um, we are in that age and we really need to progress to digitizing things so if there's anybody out there with computer experience that might like to spend a little time doing that, that would be great. Uh, we did have somebody who was cutting articles out of the Valley News. Um, anything that anybody in Grantham did uh, that they got the paper for, including dying, uh, we, we, keep, we keep that information and we have uh, notebooks full of that and again, something that needs to be digitized. And last that I came up with is organizational skills. We can certainly use help with we have lots of um, things there that, that could be organized probably better than what we have done. So if anybody has any interest, um, you don't have to commit to any specific time, but if you'd like to stop in and help us out, I'm sure we could put you to work. Thanks. When I was in the service site last week, I noticed they asked um, all of the Eastern living magazines, but also the Sunday ones, the Cure Social ones, the Lebanon ones. So there's, there's kind of a, a nice pathway of stuff there. And um, the other thing that I found there, which I think is kind of a, a visual symbolic, is this is an ornament, and in the center is just written Eastman. But all around it are Grantham long-term buildings, the church, the library, Ken's house, a covered bridge, and um, I don't know. Oh, the school, original school, right, Ken? Yes. Yeah. 
So just again, reminder that we're surrounded by Grantham and its long-term existence. And there we are. Okay, just put it Any questions for any of these folks, or for George, or um, Cindy? Any anecdotes that you want to share, that stories that you have? Yeah.
people from Holy Sawyer alumni and Dartmouth alumni, and that they had kind of come together to invest to build Eastman. I don't know if that's true or not. That's what I had been told by someone. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to know the answer. You were interested in the investors' statement. Dartmouth College, the Society for Protecting the Natural Forests, the Venture uh, to Savings Bank, and an insurance company, uh, those were four. Chuck. It came Chuck, yes. Uh, one, a couple of questions about Amo. Gene Delury, who was mentioned uh, yes. in these presentation, mentioned that he once said, Amo had asked her, why would anybody want to live here? When I was interviewing the man named Rick DeWitt, who was CEO of the uh, Jones Company, and asked him uh, for an impression, uh, I said, what, what was Amo like? Because a delightful rogue. <laughs> interviewing somebody else for this 25 year uh, book, uh, Barbara Briggs. Barbara Briggs said that uh, when she learned more from working for Amo Hansen, and she learned in all the courses that she taken to get her MBA. What do you got? Did you show the deposit book? Uh, oh, okay. The what books? The George Brack, the, the Did you bring the Did you bring the receipt book, George? Did you bring the receipt book? <coughs> You have a book of the first receipts, yes? What I brought was the, uh, the menu. Yes. And then there's that history of Tula. And the other packet is uh, simply the original DCR. And the back page of that uh, is a form that you fill out uh, and showing how much you wanted that you were going oh. to in order to buy a lot. I'm sorry. Here is an original sales agreement and
10 years. Um, after we left, it does have the distinction of perhaps being the only home that ever burned to the ground. <laughs> but that was too old. But after 10 years and caring for a house down in the Boston suburbs and also having a house on, on the road there, we decided when we saw the condos going up, and particularly the ones at South Shore 2, uh, we are number 11 at South Shore 2, that we would buy there. But I must say that we have enjoyed our many years here. We've raised our children and became active in all the summer and winter sports. And we think that in retrospect, it was a very good decision to come. Thank you.